So let's, um, let's start the discussion, uh, um, which has been sort of broken up into four chapters, uh, with this first chapter, uh, making the book. And I will ask you, Anna, so this is a missile. What is a missile? And who are the Franciscans around its time of making? Thanks, Bernard, and thanks for that very kind introduction. Um, a missal is, uh, it, the sort of basic definition is it's the book that a priest uses to perform the Mass. So it's got all the text and the music needed to, to perform the ritual of the Mass. Um, and it's a form of liturgical book that came about in around the 9th century. Before then, people needed lots of different books to say the Mass. You had one book with all the text in it, one with all the music, um, all different, all different uh, codexes were needed to, to perform that ritual. So you'd so be reaching from one to the other on the... Yeah, that's right. And so the, the missile is a kind of innovation of to bring everything into one book, a kind of compilation book that lets you um, perform the Mass from just one text. And is this, is this an early missal, or has the uh, missal tradition been going a little while? It's been going for a couple of hundred years by the time this book is made. Okay. And this particular one is made, um, and I think we might have some yep. images here. So this is, this is the missal that we're talking about and that you'll see afterwards. Um, that's what it looks like today. Yep. And maybe yep. the next slide, yep. I think. This is an image that shows you... Uh, it's actually really difficult to find an image of... a medieval image of a priest performing the missal using the mass, and part of the reason for that is that the words are there almost as a prompt in that the priest would know the text so well that they're not literally reading every single word from the book in front of them. And here you can see the missal is actually closed on the altar, sitting next to the chalice. So it's there, but it's not being read from in a kind of literal way. So giving you confidence, sort of thing. Yeah, it's that's it's right. It's, it's <laughs> that's the presence right. there, it's there. Yeah, it's it. there to refer to, yeah. and we'll be able to see that when we see some more images of of this particular Franciscan Missal, the way that the text is really heavily abbreviated and there are sort of little conventions that the scribe uses, little signs that show you when a word has been shortened to leave out some letters because you don't need to write it out in full when you know it off by heart anyway. It's there really as a reminder. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so um, I think the next image might... Yep, that's great. Um, so the, uh, the group of people who, who caused this book to be made and participated in making it were the Order of Friars Minor. And it's so lovely to have Joe and Jim here with us tonight. Um, and I think that's, that's a really good way of framing this conversation is to, to say, as Bernard did, that this is a book that is not a museum object or a, an art object. It's very much part of a living um, tradition, a living culture. Um, so the, the Order of Friars Minor were founded by Francis of Assisi. And this is an image of Francis um, in an allegory of marrying la Lady Poverty. And it's a fresco that's from the Lower Basilica in, uh, San, in San Francesco in Assisi, so the major uh, church of the Franciscan order. Um, and that's Lady, Lady Poverty that's on the Lady right Poverty there? on the right and uh, Christ in between and Francis marrying Poverty. And I chose that image because it really sums up what's at the heart of Franciscan charism and spirituality is a dedication to humility and poverty and simplicity and living a life that is as close as possible to the life of Christ and his apostles. So Francis was a person who went through a really uh, intense religious conversion. He, he grew up as a rich young man in a merchant family in Assisi in the 12th century. And then he undergoes this, this massive change of heart where the things that he used to love doing, drinking with his friends and running around with girls, he, he doesn't want to do anymore. And he changes his whole way of life and begins to dedicate himself to God and to live in a, in, a, in a simple way in the countryside. Um, and the sort of the great, um, it's not an irony, that's not the right word, but the kind of, um, the, 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 the beauty of what happens to Francis in a way is that he, he tries to live this very simple life outside the city, away from people, but it's a hugely attractive way of life. And so very quickly people begin to join him and the world that he tried to leave behind almost comes with him. Uh. And he, um, he founds an order, in effect, by accident, in a way. Um, and by the middle, so this is around 1209, that the, the people begin to join him and follow his way of life. And by the middle of the 13th century, there are 30,000 Franciscan friars. Uh, sorry, how many? 30,000 around Europe. So it's a huge, uh, th they become a really um, intrinsic part of the church from that point onwards and remain so today. And we ha I have an image of, uh, of St. Francis 
flocked by animals, a, a friend of the animals. Is that, is that, yeah, is that true? Yeah, there's absolutely some truth to that, right. although, you know, as a historian, I would unpick it in lots of complex and yeah, boring ways. Yeah, he eating out of his hand <laughs> and sparrows landing on his head. Yeah, that's true, that's true. No, th I mean, he's, he's known as a, a, a figure who embraces the importance of creation and nature in his spirituality, and so that's, that's a part of his dedication to... Um, to a way of life that is as close as possible to God. And, and, and part of that is by um, enjoying the natural world and by treating it respectfully, which is a reason he's become a, a real figurehead of the um, environmental movement in the 20th century and beyond. Mm. Yep. Wonderful. Wonderful. Um, should we, what we, should we get another yeah, one of these? Yeah, so we, I think the next slide we have... Um, so it's just going to look a little bit um, about the process of making a manuscript, and Katrina's going to... Jump in so at a certain point. <laughs> so the physical side of this pistol is it's a book made of vellum, which is an animal skin. And these images, uh, medieval depictions of making the vellum. Um, so you'd essentially have your animal skin, wash it, um, soak it in lime, and then that lime enables the hairs to be removed. The skin is then stretched, as you can see there, on a wooden frame, usually a much bigger frame than that, and scraped to remove all the flesh from the other side, and then dried on that frame, further scraped, pumiced, made into a beautiful, smooth sheet. And then from that point, it's moved to the person who's going to write on it. And in this case, with our missile, I'm going to pretend this is a sheet of vellum, um, this missile is made from nearly 200 sheets and each single sheet is folded once. And if you look at the missile, you'll notice there's a, a crease in its forage. And if we could flip to the yeah, next, yeah, sure. next slide, next one. You can see there's a bit of a, um, sort of some undulations along the forage, the, um, the long edge of the book. And that's a result of the spine running along, horizontally, along each sheet of vellum. The spine of the animal? The spine of the animal. Oh, the spine of... Uh, does this yes, yes so this, okay. This, this is made from nearly 200 animals. Which animals? Well, initially, <laughs> we, <laughs> we, um, it had been visually identified as being goat skin. Um, and By a goat? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, Visual identification is a little problematic. Uh. You've kind of got to, you know, look at a lot of skins and so on and so forth. A couple of years ago, um, there was um, a project started at the University of York um, where they looked at um, how do we actually analyse these skins without damaging them because we don't want to do a DNA test and cut a piece off. And they came up with this brilliant um, technique of running an eraser the sort of eraser you'd use when you do your comics. Yes. Um, and producing a couple of eraser crumbs. And the process of doing this would pick up one or two loose fibres from the skin. We'd then send that to the University of York, who would put it through a mass spectrometer, yes. which would separate the um, proteins in the fibre and give us a really clear reading of what it was. And it turns out this is goat. It is goat. Ah, what a relief. It's goat, it's not yeah, calf. Yeah, yeah. So, okay. um, <laughs> so um, yeah, technology is quite a fascinating yeah. way of kind of getting a deeper look at, okay. at what things are made of. So, th that line there, that, that is the spine edge of the skin. The, the, um, the vertical, the ripple that you see going ripples. vertically down. Going down, ah, Yeah, okay. is the mark of the skin stretched over the spine of the animal. Okay, wow, all right. Um, and yet, with the previous slide, yes, you can, can see those little little spots. They're actually hair, the pores where the hair follicles were attached to the skin. And with skins like this one, you can actually see one side has those little follicles, the other side doesn't. So you know you're looking at the hair side and the flesh side of the skin. And we write on the hair side? We write on both sides. On both sides? Yeah. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. One side better than the other, or...? You well, they tended to assemble the leaves so that you'd have hair on hair and skin on skin, so ah. that at least it looked kind of uniform. Yes. But I think the skin, the, the 
skin, so it's going to be smoother, a smoother surface. But they, you can't afford not to use both sides. Sides. Yeah. Too expensive to make. Take, takes a long time. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Great. Vellum. All right. Um, what's next here? Should we? Yeah, so uh, I guess at this point, after the skins have been prepared in the way that Katrina was describing, yes. then they're passed to the scribe to actually do the writing. Scribe or scribes? Like um, often only one scribe per book, but it could be multiple. It would depend on, depends, it depends on the situation, really. And in liturgical books are a different category to other types of manuscripts in that they tend to be produced within monasteries or by the friars themselves. The scribes would be would be friars, and we have some good evidence of that in this particular missal. Um, whereas other books, if they were, um, say they were, you know, romances, grail literature, they could be produced by a commercial atelier, a workshop um, that are beginning to spring up at exactly this time. Really, the early 13th century is the beginnings of the publishing industry. Yeah, but they're <laughs> as books, we know it. Books for sale, but this is not a book for sale. This no. is a book for. For use, making. that's right. Yep. Yeah, and so made within its community, um, uh, with a sc with a scribe who was probably a friar, but actually with an illuminator, or several illuminators who were commercial in this case. So it's a kind of hybrid, an example of the way that um, monastics and friars would be working with commercial artists as well as with artists within their own orders. Okay, and uh, is there? Do, do you know from like the hand? The handwriting uh, is. Have you done? Uh, look at looked at that. Does it look like it's all from the one? It, it does in this case, but we can see um, at the end of the book there are additions that have been um, bound into it at a later point uh, in the 14th century, and they're in different hands. So you can clearly see a difference in the age of the script and its style. Um, but it does look like one uniform hand throughout the mm. original manuscript. Wow. Mm. Um, and what's the picture, the black and oh. white image we've got there? <laughs> I just chose that one because it's a, it's a famous and it's a lovely image of what it's like to work in a scribal workshop, which is not all fun and games because you see down the bottom is the uh, apprentice <coughs> who's copying, he's practicing out, uh, practicing drawing um, decoration for the manuscript. And up above is his master who is angrily cursing the mouse who's stealing his cheese <laughs> for his lunch. <laughs> so it wasn't easy being a scribe. <laughs> And it's sort of a one of those career moments of who moved my cheese, sort of, the, the who's, who's eating <laughs> my cheese. That's one way of looking at it. <laughs> <laughs> and the other one, the other image I just chose because it's a really lovely example of the way in which medieval manuscripts uh, are often really very playful books. And there's a sense of humour about the way that they're written. And in this case, you have an image of the scribe um, who's, who's drawn, he's been painted into the manuscript and he's actually writing his name out as the scribe within the manuscript. Mm. So. It's pretty meta. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Look, I mean, I hate to bring everything back to comics, but uh, that reminds me of Sergio Aragones in Mad Magazine. Yeah, the marginals. He used to put those tiny little drawings around the edges of the... Yeah. Oh, well, this is really, this is the early origins of that <laughs> practice. <so laughs> yep, Humour in the margins. <laughs> yep. Life in the margins. Excellent, excellent. Okay, let's... Oh! What's um, this? Uh, yeah, these are images that I found um, online. They're from a project that's... Uh, occurring at Burbeck College at the moment and I just thought it was interesting to show this is uh, ink being made, uh, one particular recipe of ink which is a really common uh, ink and it is the sort that was used in this missal, iron gall ink and Katrina might want to say something about ink. Ink? <laughs> um, maybe not. Maybe not. <laughs> no, 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 that's fine. <laughs> well, we know it's iron gall ink. Um, when I, we, we had the, um, when we disbound this manuscript when it was under conservation, we um, had some analysis done to work out what the pigments were, and in fact, the analysis confirmed it was iron gall ink. It showed presence of iron, um, different compositions throughout the manuscript. So perhaps they were using different recipes. But ah, yeah, because you'd run out of. I mean, you know, it's a long book. How many? I guess how it many is folios. Uh, it's. The, I should know that off the top of my head, but it's around. 400 folios, 400. yeah, because it's actually oddly it's been paginated at a certain point, not here at the library. Yeah. So most most manuscripts, when you look at them, have their folio number written, which is so each folio has a recto and a verso, a front side and a back side, um, and that's those are the numbers that people working with manuscripts use to refer to it. So you'd say folio 37R and folio uh, 37V for okay. each side of yeah. the sheet. 
Um, but in this manuscript, weirdly, it's been paginated, so it's always difficult to know how to refer to it because you want to go to folios, but the number written on it is a page number. So it's got about 800 pages. Yes, yeah, yeah. okay. I just keep coming back to the idea that one person, one guy, one Franciscan, pretty much wrote out all the words. I think if you go forward, we have a nice, yeah, perfect, next one. Um, this is a really close up image, uh, and I sh probably should have provided one that shows you how close it is, but you'll hopefully you'll come upstairs and see the book afterwards. It shows you a prayer that's written at the very end of the last folio of the original part of the missal. Oh, yes. Uh, which is written by the scribe, and it's a prayer that goes back to the fourth century in its in the text, its structure, but it's been used here by the scribe as a way of sort of signing off on finishing the project of writing this book, and he talks about himself as an unworthy priest, which is one way that we know that it was not a commercial scribe who produced ah, this manuscript. Yes, yes. But you can see it's, it's, I mean, it's big on the screen now, but when you see it in real sure. life, it's almost impossible to read with by the naked eye these days because there's damage to it, but it is, it's a really tiny script. Mm. So. And so, yes. Uh, Please do come up afterwards to the upper room, interestingly, and we will, you can look at the actual book itself. But the, the writing at the top there is sort of the, in the usual size throughout the book. So you can see that this, yeah, this tiny writing here, interesting, even the, the font size really expresses humility, doesn't it? Like uh, absolutely, I yeah. And then and they are, you know, uh, medieval scribes are really good at using different font sizes to break up the look of a page as well and use a different, slightly different script to indicate an instruction to a priest and versus the text that you actually say aloud. So there's a lot of um, kind of visual decisions being made along the way by the scribe as he's copying out this text. Also, the, it gives voice. It seems to give voice to different areas yeah. of, the, of, the, of the text. Absolutely. And it is, um, you know, this is a performative text at yeah. its heart. It's there to be spoken, not to be read silently. I know. Um, I just put the, I'll just say to, I just yes. put that other image on the... Yes screen just to remind us all that women were scribes as well. Not in this case, um, not of this book, but um, there were women who were both authors and scribes working in commercial, um, in the commercial book production industry. So and in uh, nunneries as well? Uh, uh, yeah, absolutely, yeah. In, the, in the convents, in the nunneries, Com but also in the commercial industry. There were often husband and wife teams who, yeah. were, who were, you know, book producers. Okay, yeah. amazing. I mean yeah. we, we sort of need to get on to using the book because yeah. otherwise we'll I run know. out of... No, we've got to get to the flea. Yeah, I know, <laughs> I know, I know. I'm very <laughs> excited. Uh, okay, so, but we should talk that... The Katrina, can you want to talk about um, those yes, what we're buckets there? What we're looking at here is um, a range of different um, pigments that are mixed up to use for um, creating the um, decorated capitals and illuminations. Mm. Um, and I think if we try the next image and the one after that and the one after that <laughs> and the one after that, um, we... Um, had the good fortune to go to the National Gallery of Victoria and have their assistance in analysing the pigments in this missile. Um, this is a picture of um, what we used. It's an X-ray fluorescence um, analysis scanner. Um, this is actually doing a, analysing a different manuscript, but just to give you an idea of, of what it looks like. And it, um, it will give you the element if there are um, any minerals in the pigment. And from that, you can then work out what the likely pigment was. So if we go back an image, um, the blue there that's used in our manuscript um, was azurite because it had copper in it. So we ah, were quite sure okay. that it was azurite. It wasn't lapis lazuli. Yeah. Um, and the red, which you can see in the text, um, had mercury in it, which means we know it was either vermilion, which was a manufactured um, pigment with mercury in it, or it was cinnabar, which is the sort of similar um, chemical composition that's naturally found. Okay. So it's one of those oh, two. Um, unfortunately, we couldn't get a result on the um, pinks and purples because they're most likely to be um, sort of dyes that don't have minerals in them. Okay. Um, and obviously there's gold. Um, there's also a little bit of silver. Gold as in gold gold? A gold like leaf. Gold. Yeah, real gold. Real gold, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Okay. 
Um, yeah, and these these images, well, the few that we skipped over, which we should probably keep skipping yeah, over. Yeah, we should. But they're skipping. just to give a sense of the fact that this book, par part of um, studying a, a manuscript like this, is trying to identify when it was made, where it was made, and the decorative style can be really important in helping you understand where it was made. Yes. And these uh, these images are the, the this decorative style is really distinctively. Uh, from Perugia, the capital of Umbria. So if you go, I think, just quickly to the next one as we're next moving one on. through. Yep, yep. Oh, from after here? that? No. Oh, no, it's gone. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. We'll stick on this guy. But Who's but this guy? This, this is a man who was showing us what this book probably looked like when it was first made or, or, or something very similar to this. This is a, a binding for a missile and you can see the date of the painting is a little bit later. But the book itself is very similar to this missile, to this, and the binding um, is... Uh, quite characteristic of the binding that was used on missiles in that period. Okay. Uh, and that's that's part of what informed Katrina's decision making when she was working on the new binding, which we'll get new to. New binding, there's a, bit a new later binding on. coming up. Yes. Okay, great. <laughs> uh, yeah, should we go back to that picture? Yeah, sure, of, sure, sure. Um, but speak quickly. I'll speak quickly, yes. <laughs> <laughs> if you look on the outside of the boards, you'll notice there are little pieces of metal. Um, in, in the trade, we call it furniture. Um, so there's little bosses um, and little clasps. Yep. Sometimes you find little corn corners attached to the boards as well. And now if we move on to the next slide, you can see this is the first page of our missile and we've got little rust spots. So this shows us that the original binding had metal furniture, that these rust spots are from nails that held the furniture onto the wooden boards and but but that metal furniture wasn't on the book when you when when sorry when no when this, no when no this long 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 gone long gone, long gone. and in fact Old in furniture. interestingly yeah. if you if you go to the end of the original part of the text because as you remember Anna said there were a few pages this added yep. in the 14th century these rust holes are on the end of the original text yes. but not ah. on the end of the extra pages yep. so you can tell at that point. Those pages were added, it was rebound. Yes. Um, that's pretty much it for what we know about the first binding. Um, it and had it metal furniture. Okay, metal yeah. furniture. And it was and probably it red. Yeah. <laughs> it was probably red, yeah. Uh, quite uncomfortable, metal furniture. Yeah, and for the book as well. Okay, so here we are with, re with using this book. Uh, and um, Anna, again, ha ha can you tell us how did this book first feature in the religious life of the Franciscans who, who made it, basically? Uh, well, as we've said, it's a missal, so it's the book used by the priest to perform the Mass. But within the Franciscan context, it's got a really interesting role because books were a troublesome issue for the friars in the early years of the order. Why? Um, well, because they constituted property. And the ah. part of the vow of poverty and the adherence to a life of apostolic simplicity was to not have property. Of course, once you've got a book, then you need bookshelves. That you are almost exactly quoting oh. Francis of Assisi. He said, uh, he, there's a famous story that's recorded in one of the early lives where a young, uh, a young friar says, I, I can't read very well, but I'd like to have a breviary. And Francis says, no. And some of the other friars think, that's a bit harsh, why not? And he says, well, if he wants a breviary, soon he'll want a bookshelf. Yeah. Then he'll want a big chair. Then he'll want, <laughs> then he'll want you know, it'll lead to it'll lead a slippery more slope. More. The book is a slippery slope. The book is a slippery mm. slope, absolutely. But what's interesting, I guess, um, for us with this book in thinking about what it meant to the community that first used it is that even though it is a book and it's a form of property, it's completely essential to their spiritual life. So books like this missal and breviaries and personal prayer books, other books of that kind, are a sort of grey area of, uh, of, um, for the Franciscans because they are not sure how to navigate this mm. vow of poverty and this adherence to Francis's vision for their life, for their yep. communal life, with the realities of living in a community and performing the Mass and performing Mass for lay people as well. So A copy of the Iliad, on the other hand, would be difficult to argue. It's difficult to yeah, argue, yeah, yeah, but okay. not impossible, well. depending, on the, uh, depending on your legal expertise. Um, sure. One of the most famous kind of... Um, <laughs> Jim and Joe are laughing down there. One of the most famous um, kind of interventions into the Franciscan life came in 1230. So Francis dies in 1226. And by 1230, there are big problems within the order about exactly how to live the Franciscan way of life. What does it mean to be a Franciscan? And so they appeal to the Pope, Gregory IX, who 
you won't need me to tell you, is a lawyer when you hear this solution. So they say one of the issues that, that the friars approach him about is books and the ownership of books. And he says, basically, no problem, they're all my books and I'm lending them to you. Ah. Great, lo great lawyer solution to the that problem of like ownership. That sounds a the situation with this book, like it belongs, actually, yeah. weirdly, it belongs to the Franciscans, Maybe we're the but they're <laughs> lending true. it to the people of Victoria. That's true, there's some sort of poetic justice there. <laughs> <in> the <laughs> <laughs> and I think we've got some images. If yes, we, we do, move, let's get to the crucifixion. Um, yeah. yeah, so this is an image I chose just to show, uh, not a missile, this is a choir book and a group of friars singing together from the book. Um, but if we go to the next slide, uh -huh. this is the, uh, the, the most important opening of the missile. It's the uh, page of the mass, uh, it's the text of the canon of the mass, so that's the most solemn and central section that leads up to the ritual of communion. Um, and you can see its importance through the presence of the um, miniature, as it's called, the illuminated image that you see there of the crucifixion. Would that also be produced by a, a, a Franciscan inside the mm. monastery? No, m most Priory? likely that would have been a commercial artist, but it's a bit of a mystery who it would be um, because it's of much greater quality, this image, and the, the quality of the, the artist is much higher than most other missiles of this period. So that's an unanswered question for researchers of the future. Mm -hmm. If they can find other examples of work by this person, that would be okay. really interesting. But what we show here in a little detail of that image is a spot of wax that is uh, on this page. Um, and it's one of the many signs of use that, uh, that the book um, tells us really how it was being used physically. We know what it means theologically, we know, you know, historically how a missile was used, but it's the kind of signs, the things that Katrina finds in her work on the book that really illuminate for me as a historian what the book meant and how it was being used in a very literal kind of sense. So the presence of the, of the wax drop shows us, of course, the presence of candles and the environment of the mass, uh, which, you know, makes you think about how that image would look in candlelight and the effect of light on illuminated um, images, the, the presence of the gold, um, the kind of um, sensory experience of using this book can you can read a lot just from that little wax splodge, or you can if you're imaginative anyway, which, <laughs> which historians have to be. <laughs> yeah. uh, all readers, I would argue, yes. Uh, and what and oh, we don't, but we have on the left-hand page there, uh, not text, but we talked about this before. We looked at it before upstairs. This is song, right? Yes, that's right. So this is musical chant that's a part of the mass and. That's, uh, as I was saying at the start, the kind of innovation of the missile was to bring this music into the book itself rather than having it in a separate book. And so it shows you, for musicologists, it's a really important um, uh, e era of um, development of the stave, the musical stave, that we're in a transition period before they settle on the five-line stave. It's nearly there. They're at four lines at this point. Um, but it's a, you know, this, is, this is still chant that um, is performed today and that can be read by people who perform the chant okay. and that was, uh, I, ha I had a really lovely moment when I was first uh, working on this book as a student. My younger brother was in a cathedral choir for a long time and he looked over my shoulder once at a photo on my computer that I was, you know, feverishly transcribing and just started singing it and oh. it was a really, it was a really lovely, you know, example of what you were saying about the time travel. Yeah, <laughs> These absolutely. are time machines in that sense. Brilliant, brilliant. Um, okay, next, 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 next. Yeah, yeah, keep going. Oh, oh that's just, okay. a, just a, a nice close-up, but I have to say nothing does it justice compared to seeing no. the real thing, so we'll see it upstairs no. afterwards. And you were saying before that the text travels down the side of this image here. That yeah, that's that right. It's, um, we were talking about the, uh, the relationship of text and image in, in books like this, and really there's... Um, an integration there that the text is never separate from image in a medieval book. And here down the right hand side you can see the words te igitur, which are the first words of the canon of the mass. Um, and they're actually part of the image and then the text continues underneath um, in normal script. And often in crucifixion miniatures of this period, the T of the te igitur is the cross itself. So you, uh, you literally read from within the image out and then down again. So it's quite, it gives you a sense again of the um, the way in which this book was used in a performative way um, by the people who first commissioned it. Also, the, the, just the planning in, in need of the writing and going, if we're going to send it out to be illustrated, you know, we need to let that person you know, know that they need to put the word in. Yeah, there. absolutely. And you do find lots of mistakes in many <laughs> 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 No, no, uh, um, 
Okay, uh, well. I think we we keep going. Maybe. Yeah, great. Yep. Oh, Katrina, what's going on here? Now it's time for me to talk about the use of the book. Um, when we were um, conserving this book, the first thing we had to do was pull it apart, and it was apparent that there was a lot of um, debris in the inner margins. Um, as a conservator, I don't like changing the physical state of anything. In this case, we did have to brush this out because to re-sew it, you'd have these little bits of grit caught between the pages. It wasn't going to work very well. So, so re-sew it. Re-sew. When I re was re-sewing, you don't want you don't want little don't bits tell of those dirt. Guys. <laughs> um, so re I had to go through and brush out um, at each opening. And it actually ended up being quite fascinating because there was lots of different sorts of debris. There was dust and dirt and little bits of trimmed parchment, but I also found little bits of glass. If we flip to next the picture. next slide. Yeah, yeah little Whoa. bits of glass. That's um, disgusting. Fibres that might have been bristles or hair, um, little bits of glue, um, all, all sorts of things. And amongst that, um, I actually Drum found... Drum roll. <laughs> Drum roll. I found a lot of insects. Um, now, all of this goes to show that the missile was very heavily used. Sure, and not um, just by humans. Well, <laughs> it, it really demonstrates that it was probably left open for periods of time, particularly at that Te Igator image. Yeah, that's right, and Katrina... Um, it was actually double the amount of Goop. stuff down yeah. the centre yeah, of that, right. that opening, which demonstrated that it was clearly open there a for very, a very long time. Which really, which confirms what historians would always say about how it, you know books like this would be kept open at that page in a church for people to be able to see the image between masses, um, and th exactly this this evidence this is evidence of what right. otherwise we sort of say we tell ourselves, but yeah. we, we don't you necessarily have the proof. Have the backup. It's That's like right. You guys working Katrina, together like a Katrina's forensic team. making making us truthful. <laughs> yeah. Fantastic. So next. So the next slide. Um, ah. <laughs> One of the things I brushed out was a little tiny flea. Who, um, where did this little tiny flea live on? Who did it live on originally, do you think? That's going to be a question for <laughs> filmmakers of the future. <laughs> <laughs> but isn't it a rat? It's a rat flea. Oriental rat flea. Um, and they were known to be the fleas that carried um, plague. Mm. Of course, we don't know that this flea dates to the origin of the manuscript, but... No, but, I mean, the the book was in Italy at the time that the plague was in Italy. It, there's We don't have any proof, and it would require further testing of the flea to... Um, <laughs> a, a serious immigration interview for the flea to find <laughs> out exactly <laughs> where Give it, it an came English from. English test, and yeah, 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 that's right, we'd have to be pretty strict about yeah, this. Yeah. Um, uh, but at, at this point, we couldn't say, you know, we wouldn't guess that it's definitely from that period, but it's totally possible that it is. And Plague flea. Yeah, that's right. And, it, uh, you know, it's as Katrina was saying, it's part of a, a whole cast of characters that were found inside the manuscript, and all of them have more to tell us about where it's been. Not just a flea, but a so collection. Yeah, quite, quite a few spiders um, on the upper... Daddy long legs up there, isn't it? Yeah. Yep, daddy long legs. Um, beautifully preserved silverfish. Lovely. Um, some of, some of these may even be box hill insects. We don't we don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, and as I was saying earlier, I don't want to change anything if I can avoid it. So I've actually left these in the manuscript. Th these are still there. Because they're not doing any harm. They're um, useful potentially they're a very later down the track. Person, that's great. My job's not to clean the manuscript no. and make it beautiful. No. It's to preserve it and um, make it safe to be handled. And this is an unknown down here? This yeah, is that's un an unknown. The unknown if insect. anyone recognises <laughs> this, but please contact us afterwards. Um, <laughs> we're actually fortunate enough to um, have the assistance of some staff from the museum, Victoria, oh, the museum. to actually identify. I see, it's Peter Which is Peter why we Lillard. know for sure what our flea was. Yeah, great, um, great. Yeah. Well, that's remarkable. So these animals have travelled through how many unknown centuries, really, in this TARDIS of a book. That's right. Uh, and, and it would be, yeah, it would be possible for someone to do some further analysis of that yeah. at another point. And you know, that's the beauty of uh, working with books like these is that they're never, <laughs> the study's never over. There's mm -hmm. always going to be new questions for someone else to come along and ask. No matter how many years you spend researching it, you'll never finish. So yeah, yeah, an ongoing treasure chest.
Um, should we go on? Yes, yes, I think we have some plague imagery. <laughs> just to just to keep so the energy up in the keep room. Keep the energy in the, <laughs> the plague in the room. Yeah. Um, someone is being buried here. Yeah, so I just thought it would be worth giving then some social context of the plague and the enormous impact that it had on on really the whole world, but particularly on European culture. Um, the, the plague is, of course, the bubonic plague, but also pneumonic and septicemic plagues that existed. Um, and, the, and the bubonic plague was carried by the rat flea that we've met. Um, and sometimes bubonic plague could turn into pneumonic plague, which could be transferred via droplet infection. So the plague was, uh, was contagious in that pneumonic form. And when it broke out, there was an outbreak in the 6th century known as the Plague of Justinian. And then in the 14th century, there was a big outbreak that killed um, somewhere between 25 and 50 million people, which was a third of Europe's population at the time. So you get socially then enormous change, obviously, huge, um, huge mortality rate and no, and no certainty about exactly how the disease works or how to avoid it. Um, but there are famous poems like Boccaccio's Decameron, where, uh, you know, it gives us a sense of how some people reacted to the plague anyway, which was basically just to avoid it, just to get move out. to the country, okay. get into the fresh air, because it, it was thought to be an airborne illness. Um, and and it really, it, it, the trauma that this visited on the communities where plague broke out is immense, and it, and it has a huge impact on the, the religious and social culture and the artistic culture of Europe from the 14th century onwards. Although some people have argued that you probably wouldn't have had the Renaissance without the plague, so it's not all bad. But um, <laughs> the, the it's very optimistic. <laughs> well, silver lines. The the, the 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 mortality rate in the end created opportunities for some people because with fewer people in the community, there were more. There was more mobility. People were able to um, change their station in life. Um, and th if we go on to the next image, oh, this is Sebastian, who was a plague uh, saint invoked against the plague, um, and he was. He was thought to be efficacious because, as you see here, he's being shot with arrows, uh, which is the famous iconography, iconography of Sebastian, but he didn't die from those wounds. Oh. And so he's, he's, he's important as a plague saint because you will also have wounds all over your body. That's how the plague you know, ex forms into buboes in the, all the, uh, the joints, really, the armpits, the neck, the groin. Um, uh, but hopefully if you pray to Sebastian, you won't die of those wounds, just like he didn't die of his arrow wounds. So he becomes an important um, saint to invoke the against the plague, and here you see an image of him being an intercessor, um, yep. and you can see the, the, uh, a sort of dramatic evocation of the 7th century plague here. Sebastian, um, help us. That's right. Yeah, right. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So if we keep going... Yes. Uh, yeah, so um, uh, another of the books that we're going to show tonight upstairs is, is just to give a sense again of the culture around what, what the plague did in European uh, society. Um, this increased emphasis on death and the fragility of life um, and the series of images that became really powerful and much repeated in various different formats known as the dance of death, the dance macabre, yeah. um, and Hans Holbein's imagery of the dance macabre becomes the kind of standard uh, imagery of, of death and of the omnip omnipresence of death, really, and the fact that he attacks everyone high and low just the same as the plague did. Um, so we have a few images now and a book upstairs That's in our right. viewing we room. Can, we can we're skip gonna, over we're gonna, yeah, yeah, we're going to need to... Move forward. Know, yeah, so, sorry, I oh, know this is dread, dread, yeah, uh, very fast, but there we have the death... Dancing with a bishop mm. there? Yep, even bishops are in trouble. Even bishops are in trouble. Even you, not safe as okay, so owning the book. This is an interesting question here. Um, it's 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 travelled through not only time, as we've just discussed, and survived the plague, as we've just discussed, but it's also travelled through space. Uh, and so, again, we probably need to zook this so that we can give these people... Yeah. Think of a thing, if you think of a question. Get to the real question. Get to the okay, flag. go. <laughs> um, well, we'll just skip over quickly then, so I think it could, it's more interesting to hear about what Katrina is going to say about this okay. man, Thomas Phillips. Yes. But essentially, just all we know about its use in the medieval period is it was made for a community in Perugia. Yep. It was used in that region probably for a few hundred years. Ah, so it survived the plague in, in Perugia? Well, it would have been, yes, it yeah. would have been in Umbria, yes. Okay. Um, and then it turns up, really, there's a blank in the historical record until... Uh, 1798 when it turns up in a Roman booksellers um, list and ultimately ends up in the library of this man Thomas Phillips who was 
self, a self-described velomaniac who was obsessed oh, with collecting books, collecting manuscripts. But, but if I hand over to Katrina, she'll be able to talk about the evidence around this period of the manuscript. Yeah, well, uh, Phillips, um, you can see here his um, seal, which is on the inside of the front board of his binding. If we zip to the next yep. slide. Um, Phillips, for um, three years, um, employed a binder called George Bretherton. Um, this is his um, binder's ticket, so Bretherton Lagarvet. That's he bound it in 1848. And this is the binding that the missile had when it oh. um, came to the library here. Um, it's a very basic binding, I think, maybe the next, yep, that's a, a picture of what it, what the binding was like. And we've actually got the binding upstairs to look at. We've, we've hung on to it, even though we've removed it. Because you never throw anything out? Um, it Gee. tells us a lot about part of the book's history. Um, so I, I have a suspicion Phillips didn't want to spend too much money on fixing things up. He wanted to spend his money on purchasing manuscripts. Uh -huh. But I would imagine this arrived to him in um, an unbound state. There's some evidence that it spent some time in an unbound state. There's a lot of um, soiling sort of in the areas you'd expect to see if it, it wasn't sewn. Okay. Um, and so Bretherton um, so re-sewed it, it made new holes, re-sewed it in the 19th century style. I won't go into details, but um, for a book like this, it actually wasn't such a great idea. Um, the next slide will show you, in fact, the binding's just wrapped around it. It was not attached. Um, it was originally attached. Um, his, Bretherton's given it a very thick spine lining um, and yeah, it, it kind of it fell apart. Mm. Sort of, sort this of is like how the book if you got can, to you. If you can, it's yeah. how it came to us. Yeah, um, if you can sort of imagine the, the Incredible Hulk sort of bursting out of his clothing, <laughs> yeah, sure. it's kind of what's happening with this book and this binding. The the book is stronger than, than the, binding. the binding. It's not it, the bindings like this work for paper. This is not paper. Paper. Ah. Um, and also the sewing's breaking down, and this is where we get really worried. Okay. And decide some action needs to be taken okay. because if you're handling a book like this and the sewing's not um, intact, then you start getting the pages rubbing against each other. And it's something we don't want to have happen, having ink or pigment rubbing, abrading. Um, so does. hence, the conservation the work. was done 10 years ago. I go on? This, this you may yeah. go on. Oh. Uh, this, um, I was... Uh, I was just going to, I guess, say quickly how it actually did come to Australia too. Yeah. Um, the book was in Philip's collection and Philip's is a really fascinating character who deserves his own evening. Yeah, yeah, um, but he, he amassed uh, 60,000 manuscripts in his lifetime, left very clear instructions that they were to be kept together as a library after his death. But he had also basically forced his family to move out of their mansion to make more room for books. <laughs> so as soon as he died, they started selling slippery the books. Slippery slope, slippery slope. That's right. And it took over a hundred, or oh, it took more than a hundred years. The last sale of Philip's manuscripts was in 2006. So he died in 1872. That's how long <laughs> it took to clear <laughs> his Laughing, library. I would say. All that, That's right. All that time. <laughs> That's right. So uh, he, the book ended up in, in the stock of a London bookseller, W.H. Robinson, in the 40s. And in 1946, no, sorry, 1949, they decided to send out lots of Philip's manuscripts here to Australia with the hope that a rich citizen would buy the books for the State Library. So it was shown, it was on display here in the library. Um, and at that point, the Guardian of St Pascal's at the time saw the book yeah. and decided that the friars would like to have it back, essentially, to own it again. They're showing it to the Franciscans, they don't have any money. <laughs> well, indeed, they didn't. And so there was a kind of a... Um, uh, showdown really uh, in Catholic Melbourne of who are you going to support the friars or the library to buy this book and in the end a donor came forward and gave the friars the money to purchase the book and the library stepped out of the way and allowed the friars to um, to, to buy the book back mm. so it went to Box Hill at that point and it was in the library there in Box Hill until 1993 uh, when it was placed on long-term loan here at the library for, for reasons of conservation so that it could be cared for in the best possible environment. Um, and this is an image you see here uh, of um, two friars, including Jim, who's with us tonight, and um, Father Angelo O'Hagan, who passed away last year, 
who um, were uh, er, with the book at the time that Katrina completed the rebinding in 2007 in the lead up to a big exhibition. So the okay. I'll let Katrina go back to the... Great. And it looks like from the red there that it is the new binding yeah, there. It's the new binding. Post-conservation. Post post terrible <laughs> uh, uh, um, we, we yes, so yes, we okay, have a look so at, at the actual conservation work. Let us, let us do that. Um, um, so, yeah, the book was completely re-sewn. Um, and I should say that the idea behind this binding is not to actually create a replica, but to use features of medieval binding style that work well, that best serve to protect the book. So the sewing style here actually is based on what would have been, how it would have been sewn in Italy at the time. However, I decided best not to put any adhesives on it. Um, adhesives, anything with moisture is not going to do the vellum any good. So it's going to be totally non-adhesive and so I've actually included a, a lining there to protect the backs of each of the... Which are those bands coming yeah. down? The, the lining is the piece of paper behind the bands. Okay. The bands will attach the book to the binding. If we slip to the next slide, yes. you can see um, I'm actually attaching those, those bands, the sewing supports, to the binding. The, and the boards are made of? The boards are made of an archival board. Um, we did look into replacing the boards with proper wooden, medieval style wooden boards, but um, getting boards, quarter cut boards of that size in a short time period proved not to be possible. And, and we know for certain that these boards are not going to do any damage. There's no risk of any acid migration or anything like that. So it actually was a good decision, I think. Um, and then, of course, we have to cover the boards. Um, so I chose to use an alum toured skin, which is a skin like a leather, but produced a little bit differently. Um, goat? goat? It's, it's goat, yes. <sighs> goat. It's beautiful white alum toured goat skin. Um, and often when people do these sort of conservation bindings on medieval books, they leave the skin in the cream colour that it, it arrives in. Um, however, I knew that it was likely to have been red. Oh. And coincidentally, we, we um, had a visit from a um, specialist in medieval pigments, a conservative by the name of Cheryl Porter, and she talked about medieval dyeing practice and we had a bit of a play and I just thought, look, oh. I'm going to make it red. <laughs> so um, we've used um, a, a, a wood known as Brazil wood and I soaked and gently simmered it for a long time. And the slide there shows the first coat, which was actually quite hair-raising because it didn't come out red, it came <gasps> out sort of yellowy orange. Oh. But then it slowly changed colour as the aluminium in the skin worked as a mordant and, and changed the colour to that beautiful wow. orangey red. So it took 10 coats to build the colour up to that intensity that I wanted. Okay. And um, all the time, the, t the clock is ticking because you need to get it ready for the exhibition, is that right? Yes. Yeah. Great. Yes. Great. Um, so here are the skins on the binding and I'm doing the corners. Um, do go what on. else to say there? And, oh, there, and, and there it there's, is. there's the finished binding. So you can see the sewing ah, um, yes. hidden, hidden yeah. behind the leather. Um, and the lovely red from Brazil wood, which, which was, was a, a pigment... Uh, sorry, a dye that was used um, at the time, right. yeah. Remarkable. Uh, <laughs> and yeah, the binding is, is sort of totally reversible, so you can just cut a few things and it's, it goes. it's free. Pops out. If anyone wants to do something different later on, it's, it's, easy. it's, it's easy. not harmed. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, um, congratulations. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, shall we... As, as, that's... Yeah, yeah. Oh! There we go. This is oh, that's okay. We that's were okay? just showing some images of it yeah, on cool. display within exhibitions, yeah, but I think okay. we, we can... Oh, 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 oh. oh my gosh, what have <laughs> I done? Oh, um, oh, can, will I be able to do this? I think we should think of a question, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. Have you think, can you think of a question uh, for Anna or for Katrina about the book? Yeah, thank you very much. That's, that's what we wanted, yeah? I think so. It hasn't come back. No. Oh, it hasn't come back? <laughs> no. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> There's a question down. Yes. Does the book include... Oh, no. Hey, wait a minute. Oh, gosh, okay. 
700-year-old microphone. <laughs> um, does the book include funeral and wedding services, or is it just the pure standard mass services? Uh, it's, it, it doesn't have... No, it does... Hang on, let me think of the best way. Yes, it does have the text that you would use to perform those masses, yes. But it doesn't have it... It's not written out as a whole mass. The way the book works is a bit... You have to flick backwards and forwards to different sections to kind of construct the mass that you need. But the prayers are there for those masses, yeah, and for burials and all, all the major sacraments of life, yeah. There's other questions in here in the, in the, in the uh, centre. Near me anyway. Oh, yes? Um, yeah, we, we certainly do keep all of the um, documentation. Um, at the moment, the documentation stays in the conservation department, but anything that was removed from the manuscript um, has travelled back to the rare books department and has its own shelf number. Mm. But this um, is an interesting question about the whether it's... Is it actually part of the book? So, for example, the flea. Does that, you know, if, if suddenly the friars down here say, oh, look, we would like the book back, does the flea go back and all the hairs? Yeah, it's everything. It's all the book. Yeah, it's all part of the book, absolutely. Wow. Stored separately. <laughs> yeah, so it's stored separately. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Yes? Um, what would you say the value of the book would be? Um, it's, look, every, every medieval manuscript is, is really a unique item, so they're all high-value items. But um, I guess you know it has a it has a, a value for insurance purposes. But um, we don't think of it in those terms of value uh, within the context of the collection. It's about its cultural and spiritual and historical value uh, more more so than any financial. Ultimately, all medieval books are irreplaceable because they're all unique. Can I just ask? Would the book have a provenance? You know how it would you know like paintings and that would have a provenance, would this have one as well? Yeah, absolutely, and we skipped over some of the evidence of that, but yeah, there are some, as I was saying, oh, we know that it was made and used in Perugia, then we have a big gap in the historical record until it turns up in the bookseller's inventory of um, a bookseller in Rome in 1798. Um, before then, there are a couple of notes in the manuscript that show that it's been in monastic libraries in Italy, but we don't know exactly which ones. But um, we've actually published an article detailing the provenance record of it. I can give you the details if you're interested to, to so read it later. So we'd assume that it stayed in Italy, moved up and around in Italy in that time? Probably. Look, probably. it's probably fallen out of use with the Council of Trent in 15, 1540s. Uh, oh, sorry, yeah, 1540s. And that council, which was largely a response to the Reformation, and a, and a, a sort of... Um, it was a Reformation within the Catholic Church, uh, one of the results of it was a new missile that was written and sent out. And so a lot of books fell out of use after that new missile came out because they weren't, they, you couldn't update them. You actually needed a new book. So probably it stopped being used around 1570. Um, but, but it's all guesswork, really. And that's, that's where, as a historian, it's so valuable to be able to work with a conservator like Katrina to learn as much as we can from the material clues that tell us more than sometimes we can tell just from what's written in the book. Katrina, um, could, could I ask you, is there evidence of when the, the pages would have been cut? Because I can see that it is trimmed. Um, um, whereas the originally, possibly, it wouldn't have been so neat. Yeah, I, I suspect Bresriton may have cut it. It may have been cut several times. Um, I mean, it's, it's common bookbinding practice if you've got it damaged. Well, it was common bookbinding practice. To, to neaten things up, you, you use your plough is the technical term. It's like a spoke shave. Cutting, cutting the edges of the book to, to clean it up. Um, so it may, it may have been trimmed in the, um, the mid-19th century or it may have been early. I mean, it may have been bound a number of times. So, so that wouldn't have happened immediately after they finished all the artwork? No. They um, they, they, well, they, would have they, may have, they wouldn't have cut through the artwork they just finished, though. That's definitely the sign of a later mm. binder. So when you, there was an image that showed oh, part of the penwork initial just sliced off, 
Unfortunately, that's a feature of 19th century book collecting. 19th century <laughs> the book when class. books were rebound, they were often rebound to fit on a certain shelf size. So <laughs> that might mean, I know, it's a tragedy. <laughs> but it's again, it's evidence of um, the different ways in which this book has been used and um, understood over the centuries, yeah. that what seems like vandalism to us didn't seem like vandalism at the time. And in fact, many of these books have survived because people like Phillips collected them. Phillips was virulently anti-Catholic. He wouldn't. He, he specifically wrote that Catholics weren't allowed into his library, and that a couple of times he tried to sell his books to the Bodleian. And one of the stipulations was no Catholics, and they kept saying, <laughs> "Sorry, no." Um, so it's an interesting sort of fact that he ended up preserving many, many Catholic medieval manuscripts, which otherwise may not have survived to us. Fantastic. But 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 at, at the beginning, when it was made into you know, when the, all the artwork was done and the lettering that would have chopped off the pointy bits of the the skin the, the goat skin i think that would have happened before it would have been trimmed yeah. before it was before it got to the scribe and yeah. the illuminator it would have been uh, trimmed okay. into a Thank you. page yep. great is that oh there's one more up there in the corner we might call that the last question for the sorry night. you said uh if Bretherton didn't ascribe any religious value to the books then why would he have thought them valuable enough to collect? He, uh, Phillips, this was, Bretherton was his binder. That's all right. No, Phillips was, um, he was obsessed with manuscripts. He loved manuscripts. And I suppose, you know, I don't want to get into the complexities of the Reformation, but there's an argument for saying he wouldn't have seen them as Catholic books. He saw them as Christian sacred books, and he was a Christian. He just wasn't of the, uh, the Catholic Church. He was a Protestant. So he wouldn't necessarily have seen a problem there. Um, because he saw them as books within his own religious tradition and the Catholics as the erroneous offshoot. Uh, <laughs> uh, that is an excellent note. Uh, I think <laughs> erroneous <laughs> offshoots uh, are on which to end. Uh, I invite you all to come up. Uh, we're going to go across the foyer and up to the next level up and that's where the books will be on view and you can uh, speak to uh, Anna and Katrina there. Let's uh, thank Anna and Katrina for... Their contributions now. See you next time at the State Library of Victoria.